ahead. Um, does anybody know the number of uh, flexes or um, wrist flexes or anterior compartment of the forearm? How many there are? There are actually seven. Um, now, the only thing that you need to remember about it is that the common origin is the medial epicondyle. Okay? Don't <coughs> worry about knowing all the different levels, layers. Okay? And then with the area in which you're probably going to get it most protected <coughs> is it's called Golden's elbow. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. So that's also known as medial epicondyla uh, tendonitis or tendinopathy. And this is an overused injury. So if there is a medial, medial epicondyle <coughs> injury and the, um, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I should have said, um, it's really, it's also really important to distinguish the difference between the um, action of flexor <coughs> digitalis confinus and flexor digitalis superficialis, because that's actually what they are. Um, and the main difference is basically profundus um, only goes to the tip, where superficialis goes to the, only then the, um, PIP, okay? Um, okay, and then we'll talk about the innovations of the muscles, but later. Okay, so, um, long muscles, wrists, and hands, it sounds pretty scary, but there's 12 of them, but don't worry about that. All you need to remember is that the common origin is the left uh, lateral epicondyle, okay, of the humerus. Um, in, and then what happens is that you can get it during tennis elbow, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. If you do this movement, you can actually feel it. Feel your um, extensors rubbing on that lateral side. Okay, so um, let's move on to muscles of the hand. Can be a little bit scary, but here are the things that you need to, that you should know. So this is from most important to least important. Know your thinner muscles. There are three of them. Anyone want to give them to me? <coughs> That's okay. Um, so there's <laughs> abductor pollicis, flexor pollicis, as well as flexor appendix. Uh, know your lumbricals really well. I call them latent Hewitt muscle, uh, muscles because he always goes, come on, yeah? And that's exactly <laughs> what happens. Know your hypothenar muscles. So they're basically the exact opposite of your thenar muscles. You know your thenar muscles, you know your hypothenar muscles. Then you've got your interossei. Now, I was a bit naughty. I call them posterior interossei and anterior interossei, but they're probably more commonly known as palmar interossei and dorsal interossei. And I'm sure you guys have heard of pad, get, and dab. And I think that's the most important part of it. Okay? So if you want to be that A plus 100% anatomy hand uh, student, go ahead and learn the rest. But those are your most important ones. Okay? All right. So those are the muscles. Are there any questions? Because we will move on. All right, so let's move on. Here's the second case. Um, would anybody like to tell me what the uh, important keywords are? <coughs> Fantastic, push. Yes, I'm glad you guys know push. Anything else? Left? Good? Good, left elbow is pretty good. <laughs> um, there's actually been times where orthopedic surgeons have chosen the wrong limb. They've opened it up, given the person the wrong knee, and then and then um, in post-op they're like, oh, but my, my knee is still painful. And they're like, wasn't it your right knee? And they're like, no, it was my left. So, really important, yeah. <laughs> um, other things are that he's uh, actually eight. So, um, that's something to keep in mind. So, left arm is very swollen around the elbow joint and we are unable to access the range of motion due to the pain. Anybody want to have a guess what this might be? A hint is that we're talking about bones and ligaments. <coughs> A fusion, I've heard. A fusion is good. A fusion is due to the uh, condition that happened. Dislocation is another good one. Okay, I'm going to show you the x-ray. <laughs> it's a bit much, I'm sorry. 
This is the x-ray. Um, anybody want to point out maybe something that's not normal? Fracture? I had fracture. Fantastic. So the fracture is through here. Okay? So guys, this is called a supracodial fracture. Um, some of you might have had it when you were young. It's very common. It's probably one of the most common fractures in the pediatric population. And how you can tell is basically, for me, the easiest way to tell at least is this. You've got some, what looks like soft tissue enlargement. That's actually called a fat pad sign. You're not supposed to have that. Um, and this is probably the most common way to get it when you've got a push in a little kid. All right, so let's talk about general mechanisms because I think once you talk about general mechanisms, you can kind of skip things really quickly. All right, mechanism of action, just remember bush. Um, other, other than bush, it's sort of like trauma, car accidents, as well as just direct trauma. The really sad ones is when assault. So signs and symptoms that you're looking for is you're looking for lots and lots of pain, limited range of movement, diffuse swelling, as well as a joint deformity. And obviously, if there's a bone sticking out of the skin, you know it's a fracture. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's usually diagnosed by x-rays. The next year, it's going to be pretty cool. You're going to start learning how to read x-rays, and you're actually going to start reporting them to some pretty interesting orthopedic surgeons. And okay, so the complications that you guys need to know is bone, um, bone-related, so there's, there's non-union and non-union, and then there's neurovascular. So what I'm going to uh, focus on, hey, is I'm going to focus on five fractures that can happen um, and it's neurovascular complications. Does that sound good? Thank you. Um, so this is a clavicular fracture. Um, again, I'm not going to tell you about the general mechanism because it's pretty much all push. It commonly breaks in the middle third. Um, can anyone tell me why? So, so I see a lot of people doing this. So yes, it's where, it's where it bends. It's where the angle starts changing. Um, there you go. And so, okay, so the good thing about clavicular fractures is most of the time you don't really have to do anything to them, you just pop them in sleep. Um, the complications are pretty rare. But as you can imagine, because it's over there, it's a bone, it's sharp. You can get a pneumothorax, and other things and, um, that can get in trouble is your thoracic outlet syndrome. So, thoracic outlet syndrome is an umbrella term. It can happen because of a clavicular fracture, it can also happen because of other things. Some people are born with an extra rib on the top, which is kind of freaky, but um, what happens is it compresses the thoracic outlet. Um, this is a bit of a tricky question. Does anyone know what might happen if you have thoracic outlet syndrome? This was a question that we got from our anatomy teacher. It was great. So I'll show you the structures. You've got a vein, you've got an artery, and you've got the brachial plexus. So what's going to happen if you start compressing those structures? So I have like really poor hearing. Yes. Do you think something will happen to the nerves? Yeah. They're basically going to get parastasias and paralysis of like their arm if it gets really, really bad. But the first thing that will actually happen is the vein always gets compressed first. Um, and then they'll have a really blown up arm because they're not able to drain all that blood. Okay. This is a neck of humerus fracture. Now there's two types. There's surgical, which is... Um, so surgical is around here and then there's the anatomical and this one's quite cool because it has both so we've got surgical fracture here neck of humerus okay and then you've also got the head um yeah the anatomical neck so that's a pretty severe um and oh fracture so complications that you want to look out for is axillary nerve palsy and it's, this is rare, but you can also get um, an injury to the posterior circumflex artery, which will cause vascular necrosis. So something to keep in mind is that with knot in your legs, artery goes first, then sometimes vein. Uh, sorry, then sometimes nerve. Okay. Whereas with the shoulder, nerve goes first, sometimes the artery. Okay. Dislocated shoulder. I know this is not quite a fracture, but it's something that happens really commonly. So do you guys remember how back in rotator cuff land, um, I told you all about structures? Where are all the tendons usually at? Posterior, that's right. So dislocation is going to happen anterior, inferiorly. That's the most common ones, okay? 
Um, and that's just because the ligaments, which is sort of anterior and inferior, they're really, really loose. Because if you can imagine they're really tight, you'd be like, oh, that's as far as I can go. Oh, that's as far as I can go. That's a very useless shoulder. I okay? want it to be really nice and loose. But the drawback is you can get a dislocation. So signs and symptoms is you're looking for a shoulder joint deformity. And if in the body you see someone walks in whilst carrying their affected arm and there's a deformity, it's probably a shoulder dislocation. So complications that you can look out for is fractures to the GH joint. Have you guys heard of Bankart fracture or Hilsax fracture? No? Okay. So you know how if you dislocate something, you're basically popping something out? Sometimes in the moment of popping, you can actually damage the bone and the bone comes off too. Okay? It's got two names because you've got two bones involved. Let me just make sure I get this correct because I don't want to confuse you. Bank cuts is when you break the socket. So you're breaking bits of the glenoid fossa, okay? Whereas hill sacs is when you're breaking off bits of the humeral head, okay? Um, do you want me to explain that again? I'll say it again, okay? So when you have two structures popping out of one another, you can hurt either one of the structures the two structures involved in a shoulder dislocation is your glenoid fossa, the cup, and then the joint, I guess, the, the humeral head. So bank cuts, fracture of the glenoid fossa. Hill sacs, fracture of the humeral head. Cool? Other things to look out for is, again, auxiliary nerve palsy, and that's just because of how close the humeral head is to the auxiliary nerve. Um, and then another thing that you want to look for is rotator cuff tears. But in terms of the complications that you want to focus on, focus on the top two. The auxiliary nerve palsy can actually happen pre, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say pre, so once you've dislocated or when they've popped it back and they've accidentally pinched the auxiliary nerve. Um, so it can happen once you've reduced it as well. Moving on. This is really, really uncommon. The shaft of a humerus fracture, I think it only really happens in gymnasts. I haven't really seen it anywhere else or trauma, but anatomists love to um, quiz about it. And the reason why is because the radial nerve is just so close. It's just so close on the, um, um, so close to the shaft. Um, okay, so if you break it, look for radial nerve palsy. What does radial nerve palsy usually look like? Wrist drop, great. And then um, you can also look for injury to the deep brachial artery. So you just get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of swelling. Um, you'll also get um, decreased pulses sometimes. Mm. Okay, so Collins fracture. Totally did not know this until I looked it up. It is the most common orthopedic injury. So, so much for everyone telling you that knobs are really important, but apparently Collins fracture is just as important. Um, so if you see the key word, dinner fork deformity, then you know it's definitely a Collins, and this is due to a push. And basically what happens is when you hit your hand, it dislocates posteriorly and it fractures along the way okay and um this has actually not so much neurovascular complications but rather soft tissue complications anybody want to have a guess what the soft tissue complications might be like literally name any soft tissue and you'll probably get it right <laughs> ligamentous so you can get a ligament injury you can actually tear the radial and the ulnar ligament apart so every time someone tries to put, even though you know you kill the fracture and everything, but the humans take a really long time to feel. Um, if you put uh, force onto that hand, what can actually happen is instead of your arm sticking together, it can go quick. Yeah, not great, right? Okay, another thing that it can do is it can break this thing called a TFCC. Um, you probably don't need to know too much about it, but basically it's the shock absorber of your hand. So you can imagine if you don't have a shock absorber in your hand. Your hand's going to be very prone to injury after you've healed from your fracture. Okay? Um, another thing to know about this fracture is do you guys know about the length tension relationship? <coughs> yeah? Try to do a fist like this and you're really, really weak. Try to do a fist like that and you're like, oh, yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah? Okay? So a thing that they have is because they're stuck in a cast for so long, they get stuck like this. So when you get heavy, part of the rehab is trying to gain the extension back so they can form a good fist. 
So prognosis for them is not really that good, even though they don't have urovascular structures involved as commonly. Okay, let's quickly talk about scaphoid fractures. They're the uh, new wrist fracture. Um, this is the last fracture I'll talk about today. It's commonly missed. Um, the sign that you want to look out for is anatomical snuff box tendinitis. Um, the first x-ray, funny enough, never really shows a fracture. Sometimes it's really fine underneath the radar. So what our clinicians do is they just pop a cast on it, treat it like it's a fracture, get them to come back in about 10 days, and then this sort of happens. Um, by the way, scaphoid fracture is right here. So the one that you, the, the really famous one is a vascular necrosis, which actually only happens, I think, less than 10% of the time. So that's a really good thing for the person who just injured, injured themselves. But the way it goes is the more proximal it is, the higher the risk of an avascular necrosis, okay? Does anyone know where it's most likely to fracture? <laughs> Key word we're looking for there is waste. So this is the waste. Any questions about fracture before we move on to, um, you know, like brachial plexus and that kind of stuff? No? Good, okay. All right, so this is Karen. Um, again, I'll give you a couple of seconds to read, and then hopefully one of you will be handing enough to tell me all the um, key words. Anybody? Keywords? <coughs> Pins and needles? Good. Pregnancy? Anybody want to do a spot diagnosis? <laughs> oh, look at you. So good. I'm so excited. Yay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's address the uh, elephant in the room. Brachial plexus. Whoa, do you guys hate it? Love it? Don't really care about it? Anybody who love it? Woo. If you love it, you're weird. Um, <laughs> it is actually really, it's, it's important to know. I think, I think the thing about brachial plexus is that um, it's going to be one of, it's going to be one of those questions where it's like one or two questions that pop up, okay? I'm not going to teach you how to do the brachial plexus because I think there's like 10,000, 10 million YouTube videos on how to do a brachial plexus. So I'm sure you guys are more than capable to go on YouTube <laughs> because I do it like 24 hours a day. <laughs> okay, so my um, advice to you is learn it now and then look at it the night before exams because you're more likely to get quizzed on cardiovascular things, respiratory things, GIT things, okay? Those are your bread and butter of medicine. Um, Another thing that's really good about learning the brachial plexus is just knowing it for clinical scenarios. And that's what I'm going to do with you guys again. So let's start with the roots, and I'm going to be cheating a little bit because it's kind of brachial plexus, but kind of not. Let's do dermatomes and mitomes. So dermatomes, oh, I'm really sad because I've just given you the answers. I was going to ask you guys what the dermatomes were, but who wants to come to the front and, and like do like a mini, mini oski? Like just do the dermatomes. How do you test for it? I know this is neuro, but like it's still important. Okay, that's all right. Okay, um, uh, someone yell out um, where, how I would test C5 to T1. Where in my hand? Sorry, um, upper limb. Uh, just do demeter. We'll do my turn later. Very good. So I'll just copy you because you're at the back. Here, 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 here. Oh, sorry, here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anyway, that was a really quick representation. Um, another, so you need to know your dermatomes. They tend to be asked. I don't know why, but they just tend to be. I think it's because it's something that crosses both musk and neuro. <coughs> then you also want to remember your reflexes. So your bicep reflex is C5 and C6. Triceps is C6 and C7. 
supinator reflex is C5-C6, and that's because it's kind of related, I mean, bicep reflex, and then I just told you that biceps is a really good supinator, isn't it? Then you've got your finger jerk, which is C8. Myotomes, the good news about myotomes is that it's very rarely examined. I don't think I've done a question on myotomes yet. The reason why is because every time you see a book about myotomes, it tells you something different, <coughs> which um, is like the bane of every medical student's life. But I have got the, um, what's called, I think like the Asia assessment, um, assessment. Um, and basically I've taken it off and what the Asia assessment is for is for um, spinal cord injuries. So I always think that this is this is like the go-to, you know, this is for next year stuff, I reckon. If a doctor says, what's the myotome of C5, just do elbow abduction. If you can also do shoulder abduction, because again, you know, they cross over. There's a huge range of them. But if you say it's C5, and if you're gay enough to say, go check your Asia assessment tool, they can't argue with you. Okay, because Asia assessment is accepted worldwide. Let's move on. All right. So this little baby, the poor little baby, has um, got the waiter's tip. Have you guys learned about the waiter's tip? Babs palsy? Fantastic. So the most common and most famous mechanism of action is a breech birth. And basically what happens is they pull on the head. And because of the way that the vagina is sort of angled, it's sort of angled, um, uh, I guess, um, a, I would say it's angled posteriorly so in order for the baby to not just like you know birth into the table they tend to pull them out and what happens is you end up with the baby that goes all the way like that and then that gets stretched and then the c5 and c6 usually tends to just snap the good news is that uh, because they're babies and babies are incredible they tend to just heal up by themselves what you're looking for is a way to stick um then we, we're going to go to the opposite so we're going to go from c5 C6, and we're going to go to the opposite side. So the opposite is called clumps palsy. That's where you get that claw, okay? Um, so this one is actually really rare. It usually only happens to rock climbers and when they climb and then they accidentally slip and then they try to catch themselves. Um, it's when they, basically when they do that, the bottom two break and what they get is a clawed hand. Let's move on to the peripheral nerves. So that's all we're going to talk about the brachial plexus today, okay? Let's move on to the peripheral nerves. And then I guess this is the end of the brachial plexus. Okay, Mamu. Who wants to tell me what Mamu is? Easy question. Medial. Anterior. Anterior. <laughs> Mamu. Has anyone heard of Mamu? It's not anterior. Um, it's just the, uh, the very last bits, the very last bits of the nerves. So what are the nerves that innervate your upper limb? Oh. Great, fantastic, that's it. So let's talk about it in terms of um, the, just, just general basics, okay? So just about muscle um, innervation to the muscle. So muscular cutaneous, anterior muscle of the arm. Auxiliary, these are going to be really easy and then the last few will be a little bit harder. Auxiliary is always deltoids and the toes minor. Radial is the extensors everywhere. You don't need to remember which extensors, just extensors everywhere, okay? Medial, this one you do need to know. Most of the anterior compartment of the forearm and half loaf. Have you heard of half loaf? Yeah, the medial half of the lumbricals and then your femur muscles. And ulna, do remember this, it's flexor carpial nars and half of flexor digitorum profundus, the medial half. And then just think <coughs> half. Well, if it's not half loaf, it's got to be on in your um, hands. Now, this is the peripheral nerve. Do, um, I know in my year level there was a lot of confusion between the difference between dermatomes and the peripheral nerve distribution. Um, I'm not sure what your experiences are of that. Do you know that they uh, they're obviously different, but they also overlap? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, does anyone want to tell me what, oh, um, this bit is? <coughs> yes, it's the regimental patch. And what does the regimental patch do? So these are not, so yes, these are not, um, dermatomes, yeah? 
these are just peripheral nerves. So you know how we talked about auxiliary marmer. So it's one of the marmers. Auxiliary? I had auxiliary. Okay, good. What about this one? Here's the radio nerve. Very good. This one? Lateral cutaneous nerve, yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Okay, and um, the, let's do <coughs> that's also radio, by the way. Um, yellow, medium, good. Blue, oh no, good. Um, and then the inner ones. That usually, when I look when I looked it up this morning, it was actually um, the medium, the medial cutaneous nerve. Of the forearm, and then this is both medium cutaneous nerve of the arm as well as some of the intercostals coming into play. Okay, so um, this can be asked in an exam. They like the lower limbs one more, but this is good to know the distinction between your dermatomes as well as your peripheral nerves. Mm -hmm. I try not to get them confused. All right, I've taught you all of this. Okay, let's go to the radial. Um, so let's just go to a couple of palsies. I'll go through this pretty quick. You're on the last stretch, so you're doing really well. Um, so basically, uh, you can get a radial nerve palsy. It's also known as Saturday night palsy. Um, and another one, which is probably not so much to do with you, but I can see crutches in the room. You can actually get them if the crutches are too high. Um, and it actually in, uh, also impinges on that uh, radial nerve. And it's really, really uncomfortable. Um, and then you'll get people coming in with mistrust, which is kind of, yeah. So what usually happens, you're like, oh, I can't really use my crutch anymore. And then you test them and you're like, oh, you've got a wrist drop. I, I think it's just going up too high into your um, armpit. Okay, next one, couple tunnel. We already talked about it at the start. It's a common problem, so you do need to know. The mechanism of action is usually to do with compression. Um, so either you've got the couple tunnels just way too tight, or another one is you've got too much fluid in your body. So pregnant is a really good one. Women, postmenopause. So if you've got a female coming in with tingly hands, probably a couple tunnel. Um, good thing to note is that if they've got innovation to their palm, think of something else. Anybody know why they'll still have innovation to their palm? Yeah, something to do with the recurrent nerve. So funny enough, the nerve that supplies your palm comes off um, more in your forearm and it actually goes above your carpal tunnel and it innovates your palm. So it's always fingers. Um, once it gets really bad, it actually starts affecting your thenar muscles um, and you can also get pains. And then also remember your positive special test. Okay, now let's get to weird hands. Now this was a question that haunted me because it was in my bio. <laughs> Who knows what the name of this hand is? Hand of benediction. Funny enough, there's also another name that kind of floats around but doesn't really. Armor claw. Now this is clumps claw. This can it can also be called armor claw, but this can also be an ulnar claw. I don't know why they do this to us, but they've done it. Okay, and our our job is just to understand it. So yes, it can be a bened a hand benediction, which is a what nerve problem? Median nerve problem. And I always think median nerves does flexes, so that means your Fourth and fifth finger can flex, but your second and third and your thumb is just stuck, okay? So if you read someone that's trying to grab a cup and the other two just doesn't want to come in, that's a medium nerve problem. The ulnar claw, obviously, ulnar nerve problem. Ulnar most is the intrinsic space. Medium nerve, nerve does all the flexion. Ulnar probably does all the extension, so it's an extension problem. So that's if someone grabs onto a cup and then tries to let go of it, but then the fourth finger and the pinky gets stuck, that's an ulnar nerve problem. And that is exactly what they did. We were all like, it's medium nerve. I know it, it's medium nerve because it's hand of benediction, but it wasn't. It was because you got stuck and you couldn't extend it. Okay, and so it's an ulnar nerve problem. Is that a good enough explanation? All right. Other random things that I probably won't really spend a lot of time on today. Lymphatics, all you need to know is your auxiliary ones. Yeah? So whatever you've learned for um, your breast examination, 
um, as well as your hematological OSCE examination. Those are the only ones that you need to know. The most important ones are Bleed the red one. Didn't come up in our lab. Veins. This one does come out, but it's always a very simple question. It was like, which nerve is lateral? Oh, sorry, which vein is a more lateral one? Which one is the more medial one? So, leg is cephalic and basilic. Um, the fact that you already know it is great. If you want to go the extra mile, lay the nerves of the cubital fossa. Okay. And you've got your arteries. Um, in terms of your arteries, just land the ones um, that are that you can feel, the ones that you look for in a peripheral, uh, in a cardiovascular exam. And then that's all. You've made it, you've done it, upper limb, I know it's super fun, and I've talked to you for a really long time, so would you like to ask me any questions? I'm just going to get out the upper limb. I can also do my little spiel on compartment syndrome, but I don't know if you want that. Any question about medicine or what to expect in the bio? <clears throat> All good? All very excited for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you excited to go into hospital next year? Do you guys know where you're placed yet? Okay, I only land second week of December, by the way. Very typical. Um, and any other questions about just many general? Sorry? Where am I placed? I'm placed in Daniel Hospital. That's really good. Actually, yeah, I'm in ED at the moment. Um, yeah, so we get to see a lot of fractures. <laughs> it's pretty cool. We don't get to touch them though. Um, yeah, I think they're a bit scared of us. Uh, yeah, any question about just like med life in general? Because yeah, you've got you've got like ten minutes to chill. Yeah. Anyways, I'll be down if you have any questions. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.
Get started, guys. <laughs> yep, okay. Um, so low limb via stuff, like, okay, this is from first year, so I'm gonna give it to you guys straight up. Um, the via doesn't really have a lot of lower limb questions, a lot of the content that you will get will be like neurovascular type questions. You're not going to get a lot of MSK type questions and you might get some clean skills sort of stuff. Yeah. So I'm not really going to come and stand here and talk to you guys for an hour and like go through like all the muscles, all the bones, all like the nerves and arteries and whatever the hell you have down there. Um, so I think the best way to do this is to do questions. So I don't know if you guys have used Caper card, but like it's an app on your phone. It's like two, three megabytes. If you guys can download that, that'd be awesome. And um, when you do download it, you'll basically see this screen up and um, you just tap A, B, C, or D, or I don't know, which is the two questions marked in the middle. 
and um, it'll basically just light up your phone and then just hold your phone up so that I can see your responses. And like, if you're scared about getting questions wrong, that, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> if you're scared about getting questions wrong, like if you're gonna get anything wrong, now's the time to do it because it's revision. Rather try now so that it's like reinforcing your memory for when you go into the exam, yeah? Um, and then if a lot of you guys get the question right, we'll kind of just skip over the associated anatomy. If a lot of you guys get it wrong, or if there are a couple of people that are unsure, then we can revise the anatomy behind the question. Does that sound good? Uh, all right, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, sorry to everyone that's listening from home, but uh, just try to you know answer them as we go along. And if you have really like burning questions, just message someone and you know, we can go through it. Um, but yeah, so I've got anatomy questions, we've got clean skills questions, and then I've put in some farm at the end, like NSAIDs and like opiates and like gout medication, because I feel like they were taught to us in first year and then nobody really like touched on them, but we did have, I think, a question or two on the via. So it's like, do you guys want to go over that? It's pharmacology, so it's really dry, but. <coughs> We can try it, make it interesting. Uh, I've chucked it all in at the end, um, and we can just like touch on it at the end if we've got time. Cool. Um, so I've got a breakdown because everybody apparently includes this in their revision lecture slides. Uh, you can see anatomy on the via was 17 marks, but like again, this is anatomy of your entire body. Lower limb was probably like two or three marks. Actually, I think it was three marks, and all three of those questions were nerve questions. So know your nerves. Um, and then. For OSCEs, we had one station, MSK exam, which was your upper limb shoulder exam. So chances are that this year they're going to give you something to do with the lower limb. So either probably a hip or a knee exam, or maybe a lower limb PNS exam. Um, and I think we had upper limb peripheral nervous system in our formative OSCEs last year. So yeah, you might get a lower limb thing this year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I made you guys download Caper Card, but it doesn't really work here. Um, so for the first couple of slides, I've kind of got photos like this. Uh, if you guys just want to shout out what A is. Yeah, okay, I've put in animations. I hope they work. Cool, okay. <laughs> B. Awesome, C. Greater Trocanta. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fair. Oh, yeah, see, he's down here. <laughs> that's my bad. <laughs> um, D. Good stuff. D. Wait, uh, F. Yeah, well done. All right, so you guys obviously know your pelvic girdle. I don't know why I'm even here. I should sleep. Um, okay, A. Structure right there. Okay, hearing murmurs. Anybody sure? All right, okay. So we're obviously in the pelvis. We can see up here we've got the abdominal wall muscles. Uh, we've got the iliac crest, and we know that this is your ACEs, this is your pubic tubercle. And this structure is going from your ASIS to your pubic tubercle. Ingwer Wigman, right? Awesome. Okay. B. <laughs> yep. C. Uh huh. Um, D. Okay, sacro. Yeah, we got the first part. Now, we know that there's the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament, right? Yeah, so sacrotuberous, because this is the ischial tuberosity and it's traveling from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. So sacrotuberous, right? And then this one obviously is going to be a sacrospinous ligament because it's traveling from your sacrum to the ischial spine. All right, um, F said it, it's your ischial tuberosity. Awesome, so femur. Already had A. Yep. Yep, your lesser trochanter. Um, A, again. <laughs> yeah, your tibial tuberosity. And what's the tendon that attaches there? Yeah, exactly, your patella tendon. All right, B. 
Lateral. Yeah, lateral malleolus. Because it's obviously off of the fibula, and your fibula is lateral, so it's your lateral malleolus. And then C would be your medial malleolus. Uh, what's D? I don't really like this one. But. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Not really. It's uh, the solely line. <laughs> you guys are getting too many right. I was like, all right, let's just <laughs> mess with these guys. Um, it's not important. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, okay, so ligaments of the knee, which I feel like is pretty important. Um, A. TCL. Uh, B. Yep. C. C is down here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to shout her out? Yes, yeah, your lateral meniscus. Uh, it's not your lateral collateral ligament. That's another question in here. <laughs> okay, what's D? Yep. Oh. <laughs> All right, um, look. <laughs> yep, uh, that's your medial meniscus. We'll skip over E. Let's go to F. Yep, or your tibial collateral ligament. Uh, they're interchangeable just because, like, medial tibial bones on the medial side. Um, <coughs> no, all right, it's your popliteus tendon, but again, not important. I just kind of Wanted to make it seem important that I'm here. Um, to you guys something. <laughs> okay, um, we've gone through this. I guess we can skip over this. Oh, no. <laughs> you want to go back? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, well. <laughs> okay, A. Yeah, it's your PCL. What about B? Yeah, so um, I guess I'd see why you guys would be confused. Uh, like, how can you tell whether it's the ACL or the PCL? Um, your PCL kind of extends behind your tibia. Uh, this is really niche, like, don't worry about it. But, like, your PCL does extend right behind the tibia, and it kind of attaches closer to the posterior surface of your femur, uh, whereas your ACL kind of goes more anterior. It's more at an angle, whereas your PCL is more straight. But, like, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, and then, yeah, sorry. Uh, what about D? D is over here, by the way. Medial lateral. Yep. Uh, what about E? Over there. Yep. Uh, F? F is a bit mean. Um, yeah. What about G? Yep, pop the T tendon again. Um, H? Yep, pop the T tendon. Cool. Okay, um, now we'll actually use Caper Card. Um, if you guys want to read through it, and. Everyone confused, getting a lot of blank stares. Okay. okay, so we're getting a lot of mixed answers. Um, so the answer is actually C, and I'll tell you why. Because when you look at the sacrum, oh, sorry, when you look at the pelvis, like anatomically, or like when it's straight, um, your greatest sciatic notch is kind of more superior um, rather than lateral or like anterior. Um, but actually, it's your sacro tuberous ligament. Oh, sorry. Um, 
mountain biking, sacroiliac ligament, uh, which is actually the roof of your greater sciatic notch. Again, it's not very important, um, but like, I just wanted to stress the point that in the body, your pelvis isn't really straight, it's at an angle, it's pointing inferiorly. So your sacrum actually forms the roof of your pelvis and um, your pubic symphysis is actually at the bottom rather than anterior and posterior. Does that make sense? Yep, okay. Getting a couple of answers. Anyone else want to try? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So C, profunda femoris artery. So kind of like your mid shaft humeral fracture, where your um, profunda brachial artery is at risk of being severed, along with your radial nerve. Um, over here, you've got your profunda femoris artery in a mid shaft femoral fracture that's likely to be damaged. All right. <clears throat> so femoral fractures. We all know about the neck of femur fracture. Um, and do we know why that's dangerous? Yep, avascular necrosis. Um, the issue with avascular necrosis is that obviously you lose your leg and losing your leg is not very good because you can't walk on it. Um, neck of femur fractures in populations such as ours, like young people, are pretty rare. They usually only occur if you've got really high impact trauma. They're a lot more common in older people when you've got osteoporosis your bones are really weak and they fall over, they fall onto the hip and the femoral neck breaks. And um, it's really important that you fix it right away because, you know, it's bad, you can lose a lot of blood, um, you can lose your leg. Um, so yeah, and then you can kind of split up your neck of femur fractures into your subcapital, transcervical and intertrochanteric. And obviously the ones that are inside the capsule are the most dangerous ones because that's where your arteries run through. And if that place is and if that fracture is displaced, so if the bones move, then it can rip through these arteries and then you've lost your blood supply to the head of the femur. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, Intertrochanteric, again, because they're outside of that capsule, your arteries aren't as at risk. So like, it's not as big of an issue as an intracapsular neck of femur fracture. And then going down the shaft, you've got a lot of um, like femoral shaft fractures and kind of like in your humerus, you've got your spiral fractures, you've got your transverse fractures, you've got the comminuted ones where you've got multiple pieces and they're kind of just flying around. And again, because your profunda femoris artery supplies the shaft of your femur, um, if you do have a break in that shaft, you can damage this profunda femoris artery and you can bleed and you can get a, a compartment syndrome in your thigh. Um, I know we're all, we all like associate compartment syndrome with the leg because that's where like we've got the distinct compartments, but it's the same in the thigh where you have like your iliotibial tract. So like um, the fascia lata on the side, it kind of encloses your entire thigh. And if you bleed into that, because there's not a lot of space for the muscles to expand, you can get a compartment syndrome. And then you have your six P's, which I'm not going to read out to you because you guys all know how to read. Um, cool. Moving down, we've got a leg fracture here. Yep, a lot of you guys are getting it right. I don't think anyone's got it wrong. Um, do I need to explain it? Yep, okay. <laughs> Um, so fibular fractures, the issue with a fibular fracture, especially the head of the fibula, is that your common fibular nerve or your common peroneal nerve runs right over it. And um, it's also a very superficial bone, so it's very easily damaged, um, especially if you've got imp uh, like high impact trauma to the area or like if, I don't know, you fall on it and you're old and frail. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you can see that the nerve runs right over the head 
And oftentimes, if you do break it and it does displace, it can, it doesn't usually rip through the nerve, but it stretches the nerve. And that's when you have a little bit of damage. And does anybody know the sign that, oh, right, yeah. uh, you get foot drop with it, yeah? And um, that's, where, that's because your common peroneal nerve splits into your superficial and deep fibular nerves. And the deep fibular nerve um, innervates this muscle, tibialis anterior, which is what is responsible for your dorsiflexion of the foot. So when you lose that, your foot kind of hangs, and that's foot drop. And then you get that high-stepping gait that you look for in your clinical exam. Yeah? We all know what high-stepping gait looks like? Yep. Cool. All Anyone else want to have a try? Yep, some people said C, some people said D. D is the correct answer. Um, I've put this in just to stress this one point that the common fibular nerve, or the common fibula nerve, I guess, in your hamstrings, um, it only innervates the short head of biceps femoris. Every other muscle in your hamstrings is innervated by your tibial nerve. Yeah? So when you think of hamstrings, Think tibial nerve, except the short head of biceps femoris. Kind of like your forearm, when you think uh, anterior compartment, you're thinking uh, median nerve, except those two muscles that were pointed out. Um, yeah, and I guess another easy way to remember, kind of like the insertions, again, not really important, but like if you think about it in your mind, it might make a bit more sense. Your biceps femoris is actually more lateral, and um, it attaches to the lateral aspect of your tibia, right? Whereas your semitendinosus and your semimembranosus, they attach to the medial aspect of your, of your tibia. And the um, common fibular part, the common fibular nerve, is more lateral, so it attaches to the short head of the bicep femoris, which is the most lateral part of your hamstrings muscles. It's just a way to think about it. I don't know if that works for you guys. Um, if you guys want to read through this, you can. I don't really care about it much. Um, yep. Um, got a bit of a mixed bag, but yes, it is A. It is lateral. Um, if you feel on yourself, you've got big thigh muscles. The majority of it is lateral. Um, medially, you've only got your vastus medialis. And it's actually really important because it comes down and it goes really um, inferior. And it's got that um, obliquus genu, which you guys might have seen in your dissections, which are those horizontal fibers of your vastus medialis, which attach to your patella. And it pulls the patella medially, yeah? And this kind of tries to compensate for that bulky lateral, um, like, muscle bulk, or like, yeah, the lateral muscle bulk from the rest of your quadriceps, which pulls the patella laterally. And um, the vastus medialis actually prevents you from getting a lot of knee pain um, because it stops your patella from grinding against the medial epicondyle. Um, this D is wrong. Oh, sorry, the lateral epicondyle. Um, D is wrong because the lateral, lateral epicondyle of the femur is bigger. And again, it's bigger because it's stopping that um, bulky quadriceps muscles from pulling your patella too laterally. So it's helping your vastus medialis keep it more medial. Yeah?
lots of bees um, onto his bee. Again, the muscle responsible for this mainly is tibialis anterior. Um, and again, as the name suggests, it's in the anterior compartment of your leg. You can even feel it if you dorsiflex your foot, you can feel that muscle bulk coming up um, in your anterior compartment of the leg. The lateral compartment of the leg is mainly responsible for eversion of your foot. And it's those three really weird muscles like your um, peroneus, longus, brevis, um, tertius. Um, and like, yeah, so they evert your foot and they're not very important in dorsiflexing your leg. Anyone else want to try? Okay, getting a lot of different answers here. Um, the answer is your sural nerve. Um, so it's your lateral foot and the posterior lateral leg. Yeah, so it's all lateral. Um, a lot of people said saphenous nerve. Your saphenous nerve is a continuation of your femoral nerve. I think I've got it in here somewhere. Um, it's basically the cutaneous part of your femoral nerve. So that does the medial side of your leg, um, whereas the sural nerve is part of the common peroneal nerve, and that does the lateral part of your leg and some of your foot as well. Um, and then superficial fibula. I guess that kind of might be right, but also like it's not completely correct. Because when you look at a dermatomal picture, um, sorry, not a dermatomal picture, a cutaneous picture, um, you can see that it's mainly like your, oh, it's not even on this. Yeah, you've got your sural nerve down here. Um, again, this is kind of like a clean skills esque question where you need to know your dermatomes. Um, you can kind of cram this picture if you want, but the way I remember it is kind of just moving from up to down. So you've got L2 kind of like in your upper thigh, you've got L3 on your lower thigh, um, and then L4 is your medial leg, L5 is your great toe, S1 is your small toe. And then S2 is kind of like the superior part of your popliteal fossa, the back of your um, thigh. And then S3, S4, S5, your butt. So if you really want to test those, you can, but I wouldn't recommend doing that in an OSCE. Um. Um, so this may or may not have been a question on our Vara, um, but it's just to highlight the importance uh, of the difference between dermatomal and cutaneous distributions. So dermatomes are your spinal levels, yeah? So L4, L5, S1, S2, etc. Whereas your cutaneous distributions are the cutaneous paths that your nerves take. So like 
the parts that your femoral nerves innervate or the part that your lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh innervates or the part that your obturator nerve innervates. And you can see here that she's got pain on her anterior thigh over her patella and over the medial aspect of her leg. Yeah? Do we really know a dermatome that extends between the entire anterior thigh and the medial leg? I mean, I guess kind of L4 would be the medial leg, but it doesn't really do the thigh, right? So it's more of a cutaneous distribution, which is injury to the femoral nerve. And then because the saphenous nerve is a continuation of the femoral nerve, it would affect the parts that the, the saphenous nerve innervates as well. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, again, just the difference between cutaneous and dermatomal distributions. <coughs> Yep, pretty straightforward. Um, you avoid the sciatic nerve and upper outer quadrant. Um, hitting the sciatic nerve is not the best thing to do. It'll be very painful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, seeing a lot of bees. Why B? It is B. Um, you can kind of rule out. So everybody knows that it's sciatica because like posterior leg pain or back pain radiating down your leg um, past your knees. Also, it has to be past your knees to be sciatica. Just a little niche thing. Um, but again, it's B because they did an MRI of his lumbar spine and it showed no obvious abnormalities. You would see a spinal disc herniation on that. You would see lumbar canal stenosis. You would see if there were two vertebrae that had slipped out of position if you had done an MRI of that area. So obviously it's nothing to do in the lumbar spine and it's probably to do with piriformis impingement. And um, this is also known as piriformis syndrome where your piriformis muscle becomes inflamed either by like overuse or if like, you know, you've just been sitting around for a while and you're putting a lot of pressure on it, or like if you've got trauma to the area, it can get inflamed. And because the sciatic nerve runs right under the piriformis muscle, it impinges on that um, nerve and that causes sciatica type pain. getting a lot of answers here um so the answer is actually a yeah um so the difference between halfway along the inguinal ligament and halfway between the pubic symphysis and the acyst is that the inguinal ligament attaches to your pubic tubercle yeah not your pubic symphysis so it's a bit more lateral um and then oh that's not in here but okay anyways um in your femoral canal uh, sorry, in your femoral triangle, you've got your three structures, right? You've got your vein, you've got your artery, and you've got your nerve, yeah? And the vein is the most medial uh, structure because you've got a veiny penis. So vein is the most medial. And then you've got the artery in the middle and the nerve more laterally, right? Um, and you can kind of figure this out because your inguinal ligament is more lateral than um, your... Oh, sorry, the attachment of the inguinal ligament to your pubic tubercle is more lateral than the pubic symphysis, right? So halfway along the pubic, uh, the inguinal ligament is going to be more lateral than halfway between the pubic symphysis and the aces. So that's where your femoral nerve block is going to go because that's where your femoral nerve is. If you wanted to get access to the femoral artery, you go halfway between the pubic symphysis and the aces. 
Yeah? And can you think of why you'd want access to the femoral artery? Okay, sometimes, like, if you're having a heart attack, they go through your femoral artery to get to your heart. So, I don't know, they might ask that, I doubt it. But. Yeah, um, I think A and C are both correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's my bad. I think that's supposed. To... Oh yeah, I changed it on this, but not on that. Um, th it does arise from L2, L3, L4, um, but that's <laughs> supposed to be L3, L4, L5. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, again, it does supply skin over the medial malleolus because of your saphenous nerve. That's where it runs. And um, L2, L3, L4. You can remember that if you want. It's not that important. But again, you can also remember, you can also kind of like figure it out if you don't want to remember it. You can figure it out by remembering your dermatomes and the cutaneous distribution, right? So we know that your femoral nerve does the anterior part of your thigh as well as the medial part of your leg, yeah? And if you remember your dermatomes, L2, L3 is the anterior part of your thigh and L4 is the medial part of your leg. So femoral nerves, L2, L3, L4. Make sense? Um, you don't really have to remember this. You can if you've got a lot of free time on your hands, but I don't recommend it. It's not worth it. It's really not worth it. Uh, this also may or may not have been a question on have higher. Just putting that out there. Yeah, it is the femoral nerve. Remember, anterior medial thigh, anterior thigh is your femoral nerve. The lateral part of the thigh is your lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Does anybody know where that can commonly get impinged? Just under the inguinal ligament where it attaches to the aces, because it runs right under there and it's a small angle. Sometimes it can get impinged there. And if that does happen, you get pain along your lateral thigh. Yeah, but because it's your anterior medial thigh, it's more likely to be your femoral nerve. Um, if it was just the medial thigh, can anybody tell me what nerve it might be? Obturator. Yeah, obturator. Cool. And um, also, she's given birth. Femoral nerve palsy is rare, but also kind of associated with giving birth. <laughs> know what it potentially could be? Yeah. Anyone else? Alright, this is a bit of a hard question. Okay, so this guy's just been in a high-speed car crash. What happens in a high-speed car crash? <coughs> yeah, your hip gets displaced, right? Does it get displaced anteriorly or posteriorly? Posteriorly. Yeah, because you're sitting down, your hip is flexed. If you get into a car crash, your dashboard is going to hit you in the knee and your femur is going to fly backwards, yeah? So it's going to get displaced posteriorly. So which nerve runs behind the femur? Sciatic nerve, yeah? Which one of these findings would you get if you damage the sciatic nerve? 
yeah, loss of your ankle jerk because you've lost your tibial nerve and the tibial nerve innervates the posterior compartment of your leg and that's what you're testing when you're doing your ankle jerk reflex, which is when you hit the Achilles tendon and like, you know, you get that, you know, that, that thing. Yeah, everyone knows what I'm talking about? Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, dislocation of the hip joint. Again, um, you can see that his leg is shortened. So it's obviously been dislocated. Um, and when it gets dislocated, your quadriceps and your hamstrings kind of pull it down. That's why it looks shortened. Um, it's slightly flexed because, again, mechanism of the injury, he was flexed. He's dislocated it. It's not going to go back down, yeah? So it's going to stay slightly flexed. Abducted and it's externally rotated. That's because just of the shape of your um, pelvic bones, your, like, yeah, femur kind of just stays in that position. So flexed, abducted, externally rotated is a displaced femur or a dislocated femur, yeah? Uh, this may or may not. It's exact <coughs> as well. So the answer is your saphenous nerve. Um, it's not your medial or your lateral plantar nerves because those are these nerves over here which innervate the sole of your foot and those come off with your tibial nerve. Um, your saphenous nerve, again, remember, it does the medial leg as well as it extends all the way down to just kind of below your, your foot, I guess, just a little bit. Um, and then what would this blue part be? What nerve would that be? Yeah, your sural nerve. Exactly. Cool. And again, this image. I've shown this to you guys like five times now. It's really important. Please learn it. Also the dermatomal one. So your tibial nerve. So remember your medial and your lateral plantar nerves come off with your tibial nerve. And that does the sole of your foot, yeah? Um, your deep fibular nerve does that space between your two toes. Do you guys remember that? Um, between your first and your second toe. The superficial fibular nerve does the entire dorsum of your foot, except the parts that are done by like your saphenous and sural nerves. The rest of it is done by your deep fibular nerve. And we've talked about the saphenous nerve a lot. Um, I hope you guys already know that. And then superficial fibular nerve, um, again, gives rise to the um, dorsal. Okay. Yeah, L1, L2. And what do you get after L1, L2? What does the spinal cord become? Yeah, quarter equina. And, oh, whoops. Okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I guess we, it's kind of obvious considering we just brought up the quarter equina in the question before. Um, quarter equina syndrome is actually really important because it's a medical emergency. I honestly don't know why. I, I guess it's just not very great to, you know, lose fecal and um, bladder incontinence. Um, and, you know, back pain is obviously bad. But quarter equina syndrome is really important because, um, and like, I guess it's characterized by that saddle anesthesia as well as all of these other features um, like your bowel and bladder incontinence and um, your sciatica type pain, things like that. And um, basically it's from trauma or like spinal stenosis or other inflammatory conditions which kind of affect your lower back and um, kind of impinge on your quarter equina. And um, it's important to know that the spinal cord ends at the level of L1, L2 because every time you're doing a spinal anesthetic or any time you're putting a needle into that space, you always go below L1, L2 so that you don't hit the spinal cord. 
if you hit the spinal cord, that's obviously very bad. But because you're going below L1, L2, and you've got the cord equina, and those are basically mo lower motor neuron lesions, uh, lower motor neurons, they kind of just move out of the way, yeah? Because it's like kind of like hair. So they move out of the way when you stick your needle in there so you don't hit anything, you don't cause any pain to the patient. Actually, before we do this, um, do you guys kind of just want to go over the pathways of the nerves just one last time, just because it's so important? Yeah? Okay. So, we'll start um, obturator nerve. What pair of muscles or what set of muscles does it innovate? Yeah, your leg adductors, right? And that's like your medial thigh, so your medial component of your thigh. Um, what about femoral nerve? Yeah, your quadriceps. Um, what about sciatic? Your hamstrings, right? Um, and then what about your common perineal? All right. Um, it basically does the anterior and the lateral parts of your leg. And then tibial. Yeah, posterior. Um, and then I think it's the tibial that goes to do the foot. I don't, I don't really know, to be honest. But it's honestly not that important. It's dumb. The foot is dumb. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so those are basically the muscle compartments that are innovated by each nerve set, I guess. Um, and your femoral nerve, we all know it passes under the inguinal ligament, halfway between inguinal ligament or halfway between acis and pubic tubercle. Oh, sorry, halfway between acis and pubic symphysis. Which one? Yeah, between tubercle and acis, right? And it passes under that, gives off fibers to your quadriceps, and then it gives off your saphenous nerve branch, and your saphenous <laughs> nerve branch travels under the sartorius in this thing called the subsartorial canal. Don't remember that, it's not important. Um, and it goes through the adductor hiatus, which kind of puts it into the posterior side of your foot, um, or like your posterior medial side of your foot, where like the saphenous nerve becomes cutaneous and then innervates your skin over the medial leg. Yeah? Your sciatic nerve, we all know comes out of the greater sciatic foramen, um, comes down, innervates the hamstrings, and then it splits just, just above this uh, popliteal fossa into your common perineal and your tibial nerves. Your common perineal, remember, is more lateral. Your tibial is more medial, and they travel down. Your common perineal hooks around the head of the fibula, where it can get commonly damaged, and then it splits into your superficial and deep fibular nerves. Yeah, And then they innervate their respective muscles, Tibial travels posteriorly and innervates the posterior compartment of your leg, yeah? And then they go down to the foot and do whatever the hell they want to do. Um, cool. And then we've talked about the obturator. Comes out of your obturator foramen. Remember, the obturator foramen looks big, but, like, there's the membrane, and it's actually got a really small hole, yeah? So it can kind of sometimes get impinged there. But I don't think anyone really cares that much about it. Cool. Let's talk about arteries and veins. <coughs> Okay, getting a lot of mixed answers. It's actually a great saphenous vein, yeah? So, two big superficial veins in your leg, your great saphenous and your lesser saphenous vein. Yeah? Your great saphenous vein is medial, lesser is lateral. I guess lesser for lateral, L for L, uh, great for medial. And um, it travels just over the anterior border of the medial malleolus, and it's very superficial. You stand for a very long time, and you kind of just feel down there, you feel a very nice big vein. Um, and that's your great saphenous vein. And oftentimes it's used in coronary artery bypass grafts where they kind of take it out and they use it in your heart if you've got bad artery disease. Um, yeah, so they move up. And then your lesser saphenous vein um, kind of like drains into your popliteal vein in the popliteal fossa, whereas your great saphenous vein, because it's great, it's massive, so it comes all the way up your thigh and it comes in at your femoral um, triangle where it drains into your femoral vein. Yeah, so that's the main difference between them, where they kind of drain into your, um, your 
deeper circulation. Um, you guys can learn this if you want. Uh, actually, you should learn this. Um, so do you guys know where to palpate your pulses? In the lower limb, there's four big ones. Femoral, yep, femoral is one. Popliteal, yep. And posterior tibial, yeah. And your posterior tibial is on your medial side behind your, your medial malleolus. Um, uh, and then your dorsalis pedis is a continuation of your um, tibial artery as well. Um, and it travels just anterior and it's lateral to your flexor hallucis longus tendon, which is that big tendon that you see when you stretch your toes out. Cool. And um, these are common sites of vessel damage or laceration where like, because they're so superficial, sometimes if you have damage to this area, you can rip through these arteries and veins and obviously that's not very good because you lose a lot of blood. Um, so we know a femoral artery is very superficial in your femoral triangle. That's where you can feel it. So you can get damaged there, popliteal artery in your popliteal um, fossa. And then you guys can read the rest. Um, it's medial to the femoral vein. It's right next to the femoral vein. And the femoral canal is this thing over here, which includes some of your lymphatics. And it's actually kind of important, I guess, because it allows your femoral vein to dilate. Yeah? When you've got a lot of blood going to your lower limbs, say if you're running or you're exercising and your legs need a lot of blood, your artery is obviously going to pulse away. But because your vein doesn't really have a lot of, you know, like... <coughs> pressure to combat that, it can get squished. So that femoral canal is kind of like a space to allow the vein to expand to return blood back to the heart if there is a lot of blood flow to your lower limbs. Yeah? Um, it's kind of niche, but they could ask it because it is kind of important because if you didn't have that, you'd have a lot of blood being accumulated in your lower limbs and then you get like that pitting edema and um, fluid retention. Um, I think I included this picture just so that we can go over the nerves and the veins and the um, arteries, but we've already done that, so it's not that important. Um, popliteal fossa, if you really care that much, you can learn about it. Um, the borders are all muscles. Um, you can remember, we all remember that your biceps femoris is more lateral, and then your semitendinosis, your semimembranosis is more medial, and then the inferior borders are done by your gastrocnemius muscles. We're going to some clean skill stuff. She's clearly 64. So it's D, weakness in your left gluteus, gluteal medius muscle. Um, uh, I think that's supposed to say gluteus medius. Anyways, um, so somebody said A, A. What's the rhombic test used for? Yeah, it's balance. Chest, it checks your cerebellar function, right? Um, it's obviously not a dislocation of your right hip because you wouldn't be standing like that. Um, fixed flexion deformity, we'll talk about it in a little bit. And then weakness in your left gluteal medius muscle. Does anybody know what this sign is called? Yeah, Trendelenburg sign. And um, does anybody know the nerve that's commonly damaged that leads to this sign? Yeah, superior gluteal nerve. And um, your superior gluteal nerve innervates your um, gluteus medius and your minimus, and the inferior gluteal nerve innervates your glute max. <coughs> Yeah.
Yep, Thomas Test. So you all remember Thomas? Oh, okay. Let me talk about it in a bit. Yeah, McMurray's. So it starts with an M for menisci. Uh, yep, so it's C. Um, this always used to confuse me between true leg length and false leg length. So false leg length is from your umbilicus to your medial malleolus. And um, I guess that's kind of because if you did have pelvic tilt, it would kind of tilt along like the axis of your umbilicus. So if your umbilicus is like the center of rotation and tilt a little bit, so that umbilicus would be in the middle. Um, and false leg length would kind of make it seem like obviously one leg is longer than the other just because your pelvis is tilted and the one side is falling down a little bit, yeah? Whereas true leg length, because it's from bony landmark to bony landmark, it's actually checking the, the actual distance of your bones. So even if it is tilted, because the ACEs on the side that's like more superior is also like, yeah, because the ACEs is also superior, <coughs> the true leg length stays the same. Um, whereas your false leg length would decrease. Does that make sense? Yeah? It confused me a lot in second year, but kind of makes sense now. Okay, so we'll go through all of these tests because these are all the options that they gave in MCQs, and um, you should probably know what each of them are for. Yeah? So, anybody tell me what Braggart's test is for, for God's test? Anyone? Shout it out. No? Okay, it's it's part of your straight the straight leg raise test for sciatica. When you raise it and you get you get pain, um, it's similar to E last year's test. I don't know what his name is. Um, it's also part of the straight leg raise test. The difference is that I think it's Braggard's test, which is when you get pain at ten degrees of hip flexion when you um, dorsiflex the foot. Whereas Lassigue's test is when you get pain without dorsiflexing the foot between 30 and 90 degrees of hip flexion. Does that make sense? A little bit? Okay, empty can. Yep, supraspinatus, uh, finger nose. Yep, cerebellar function, Lachman's. ACL, yep, McMurray's, we've talked about this. Yeah, you're in this guy. Phalens. Yep, Rombergs. Yep, Schobers. I, I didn't know about this until this year. It's for this thing called ankylosing spondylitis. Um, it's basically when your lumbar vertebrae fuse together so you don't have that flexion extension and it's kind of just fixed. Um, okay, anyways. Thomas? Yep, fixed flexion hip deformity tinnels. Mm -hmm. Trendelenburg. Yep, Vargas. Okay, and Varus. Yep, cool. Um, do you want me to explain any of these tests to you guys? Anyone? All good? All good? Okay. Cool. Um, so do you guys want to go through clean skills just generally um, to jog your memory a little bit? Okay. So anytime you're doing an uh, MSK exam, you always want to examine the joint that they want you to examine and then just mention, I'd like to examine the joint above and below. Wins you brownie points. It might even win you some points in the OSCE. Yeah? Um, they won't make you do it though, so don't worry about time. Um, and then general inspection, obviously, for the lower limb, you're looking at their posture, if they've got any crutches or something, um, look at the body habitus, because that can, like, cause osteoporosis, um, oh, sorry, osteoarthritis. Um, 
And then obviously your other general stuff, so scars, rashes, swelling, muscle bulk, and then look at their gait. Look at how they're walking. Do they have a normal gait? Do they have that Trendelenburg gait, which would be your um, glute med weakness? Do they have varus or valgus deformities? Um, do they have foot drop gait? Things like that. And then before you start palpating, you might want to ask about pain. So you can start away from that area. And then it's always good to know your surface anatomy um, because you're going to be palpating for your bony landmarks. So I always started at the ACEs, moved backwards along the iliac crest to your posterior superior iliac spine. Um, they say iliac tubercle, but I don't think you can really feel that, to be honest. Um, if you can, it's good for you. Um, and then move from the pieces to the greater trochanter. And then the rest, they tell you to do it, but like don't do it in your osteos because they're kind of close to your groin, so not very great. Um, and then you want them to move. So always do active before passive, because when they do active movements, they're going to stop when they have pain. So it gives you this kind of, I guess, benchmark for your passive movement, yeah? So if they can only flex to about 30 degrees before they get really painful, you're not going to try to get them to passively Oh, sorry, I, I made a mistake there. It's supposed to be active and then passive. Um, you're not going to try to make them flex all the way to 120 degrees when actively they can only go to about 30 degrees before they hit like a wall and they get really bad pain in their hips. Yeah? So just keep that in mind. And then you guys can learn the degrees if you really want to. And then you've got the three special tests, I guess, which is your true and your false leg length. And then your Thomas test, which is your fixed flexion hip deformity. Do you guys all know how to do these? Yeah? Thomas test, you get them to lie down, and then you get them to flex their hip up, and then you see if their, um, their straight leg is rising off the table a little bit. Um, okay, knee exam. So when you palpate, you always want to palpate all your bony landmarks again. You want to feel the joint line. You want to feel your femoral condyles, your tibial condyles. You might want to feel your fibular head if you want. Um, the apex and the base of your patella. Remember the base is superior, your apex is inferior. Sometimes it can get confusing. And then you can feel some of your muscles as well. Feel in the popliteal fossa, feel for the popliteal pulse. It's hard to feel, but try anyways. Um, and then you might also want to look, look out for a Baker's cyst or any other bursitis around that area. Um, and then movements, really easy in the knee, just flexion and extension. And then you've got a lot of special tests. So remember, you've got one test for every single ligament that's in the knee. And you've basically got six ligaments, yeah? You've got your ACL, PCL, your MCL, LCL, and then you've got your two menisci. So you're going to do a test for each of those. So you can do an anterior and posterior drawer test, check for your ACL and your PCL, where you sit on their foot and move it anteriorly and posteriorly. And then varus and valgus stress test, check for the collateral ligaments. And then your McMurray's test, which will get rid of both of your medial and your lateral menisci. Um, sometimes they use this thing called the Lockman's test, which is kind of like the anterior drawer test, but instead of sitting on their foot, instead of their foot being in 90 degrees, it's at 30 degrees and you hold the bottom of their foot and then try to move it. It's really dumb, but apparently it's got a higher sensitivity and specificity for ACL tears, but I don't think anybody really cares about that. Um, and then again, your, your bursitis, you can do your patella tap test, your bulge signs, and then if you really want, you can check for patellofemoral syndrome where your patella is grinding against your femoral condyles and causing pain. Um, and then foot exam, I don't think you guys will get this, but like read over it maybe the day before your osteos, just in case, but it's really not that important. Special test, maybe your Achilles tendon integrity test, but yeah, not very important. Um, and then I included back and spine exam just because nobody went over this for us last year. Um, but yeah, so you, you can basically break it up into your C spine, which is, and then your thoracolumbar spine, which is your um, thorax and lumbar spine, obviously. Um, so again, same principles, general inspection, palpation, and then movement. And then you don't have special tests for your C spine, um, but you do have a couple for your thoracolumbar spine. Um, so again, with the thoracolumbar spine, the only thing that I really want to point, around, uh, point out is when you're doing rotation, make sure that their pelvis is stabilized. So get them to sit on the side of the bed before you get them to rotate side to side because you can rotate your pelvis and it can look like you're rotating a bit more than you actually are. Yeah? Um, special tests. So remember we talked about Schober's test. So that's for your angst spawn um, where you mark out your pieces, go 10 centimeters above, 5 centimeters below, and get them to flex forward as far as you can. 
Don't stand behind the patient when you're doing this. That's a bit weird. Stand to the side of them. Um, and in a normal person, uh, that distance, that 15 centimeter distance, should increase by greater than five centimeters. If it doesn't, obviously their lumbar vertebra are a bit fused together, so that distance isn't increasing as much as it should. Yeah. And then your straight leg raise. Again, you're doing for a sciatica. Um, remember, we talked about Braggart sign and Lassie sign. I think I flipped them around when I guys. Um, it's basically pain between 30 and 70 degrees of hip flexion. Um, and then last of you sign is when you dorsiflex the foot at around 10 degrees and that causes sciatica type pain. Um, and when you're doing a straight leg raise test, do the cross straight leg raise test. I don't really know how this works, but apparently when you li lift the right leg, it causes pain in the left leg. If you've got sciatica there, I don't know how it works, but apparently it does. And it's in our principles books, so know it. And then femoral <laughs> uh, stretch test is basically get them to lie on their belly button, get them to um, you know, uh, flex their knee, and that should cause pain over the femoral area, which is your anterior thigh, maybe your medial leg, remember that? And you can aggravate that by just get them, getting them to extend their hip a little bit. Cool. Yeah, D. Um, so all of these are part of your peripheral nervous system exam, but it's part of general inspection. So if you're feeling for temperature, you're palpating. If you're looking for power, you're getting them to move. Um, and then turn is obviously its own thing. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to try? Yeah, a couple of A's. It is A. So, clonus, do you guys remember when you sharply dorsiflex their ankle or their patella, you push it um, down, it like bounces around a little bit? And that's because you've got hyper excitability or you've got increased, like, it's kind of like having increased reflexes in your muscles, yeah? And that's because of an upper motor neuron lesion. So, what your brain does, it sends these inhibiting neurons from your brain down to your spinal cord and it kind of like decreases those reflexes. So when you've got an upper motor neuron lesion, those reflexes are going crazy, yeah? So every time you like dorsiflex sharply, it's kind of like doing a reflex test um, where it's gonna keep bouncing back. So again, if you have an upper motor neuron lesion, you're gonna have increased reflexes as well, yeah? I think that's another question in there, but anyways. Okay, maybe we'll start zooming through because we're going over time. But yes, it is B. Um, D, that is reflexes diminished, but clonus present is an upper motor neuron lesion, remember that? Um, and then muscle wasting and fasciculations, those are lower motor neuron signs. Arms drifting downwards, that's your rhombergs, and then your plantar reflex going up, that's an upper motor neuron, so that's a positive Dubinsky sign, yeah? So quadriceps, again, if you think back to your um, dermatomes, myotomes, a myotome is very similar to a dermatome, yeah? So we talked about L2, L3 being your thigh, and then L4 kind of being like your medial leg. But you can tell L3, L4 is going to affect like L3-ish. So that's your quadriceps. So you're going to lose that quadriceps tendon reflex, yeah? Um, if you've got like an S1, S2, then you like start losing it in your um, plant, um, your ankle jerk reflex. And then do you guys want to go over the PNS exam? Yep. Okay. So general inspection, I use the mnemonic SWIFT, the scars, wasting, involuntary movements, like chorea, uh, myoclonus, which is kind of like chorea, um, fasciculations, tremors. Um, and then you want to look around the surroundings, ask them to stand because you want to check their muscle power. Obviously, if they can't stand up without using their hands, they're going to have decreased power. So you can start to anticipate that when you're checking for power. 
we're going to do a treadmill and bags test because remember you're looking at that superior gluteal nerve lesion. Um, you want to do the pull test because Parkinson's, you guys will learn this when you do more um, neuro stuff towards the end of the year. Um, but like, it's just to test for Parkinson's and then rhombus test and then gait. Um, yeah. And then you, you've got the special gait, so your tiptoe, your heels and your heel to toe. Um, checking tone, you want to check it at your knees and at your ankles. Um, and then you can have hypertonia, hypotonia or rigidity and spasticity. Obviously, hyper and hypotonia is because, like, um, sorry, hypotonia would be the upper motor neuron lesion because remember, you've lost those inhibiting um, neurons, so your muscles are going to be stiff, yeah? They're going to want to stay in the position that they are. And then rigidity and spasticity. Rigidity is very specific for Parkinson's disease, and then spasticity as well is kind of similar. Um, and then clonus, we've already talked about it. Um, and then power. So power you grade on a scale of zero to five, where zero is nothing and the five is normal. You can remember the ones in the middle if you really want to. Um, but like for OSCEs this year, you will, I would definitely have five out of five power. And then you can remember the myotomes. You can remember the myotomes if you want. Um, I don't really recommend it. Um, anyways, reflexes. Again, remember you've got your three reflexes. So your patella tendon, your um, Achilles tendon, and then your plantar, your Babinski reflex. They're not going to make you do the Babinski reflex this year. Um, I don't think they will. They didn't, they didn't make us do it. Um, and the other two are pretty easy compared to your upper limb reflexes because the tendons are so big. Um, and then you rate it from zero to four or zero to five, depending on the source that you read it from. But the really important thing to remember is that Normal is two. Normal is in the middle. Normal is not four. Normal is not five. It's in the middle. Yeah. Hyperreflexia will be like four, three, three, four, and then hyperreflexia will be one, two. Um, coordination: you know, heel, shin, toe, finger, rapid alternating movements. Um, yeah, you usually do this with your upper limbs, but like I guess in a lower limb PNS you do it. Um, but they all look for cerebellar function because your cerebellar is um, cerebellum, sorry, is responsible for coordination and stuff. Uh, and then sensation, remember your dermatomes. So L2, 3, 4, um, 5, S1, S2. Um, and then, yeah. Oh, sorry. Here, I should really point out, um, two-point discrimination, you start distally, move proximally. I, they didn't get us to do it, but they might get you guys to do it. Um, vibration, you do it on the bony prominences. So like, at the big toe or like at the MTP joint of your big toe. And then if that doesn't work, then go to like one of the malleoli. If that doesn't work, go to your knee, your patella. If that doesn't work, go to like the ACES. Um, but you always start distally, move proximally. Um, and then proprioception, again, you want to start at the big toe. Hold it by the sides, not from top and the bottom. Yeah, because they can feel the pressure. Um, and then either up and down. And then if that doesn't work, the ankle, hip, knee. Oh, knee, hip, sorry. And then compare both sides. Don't waste a lot of time doing this. Do it really quickly. Don't be like, oh, yeah, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Yeah, like, go through it really quickly because this takes up a lot of time if you spend a lot of time on it, but you can do it really quickly. Okay. And then special nerve tests. If they say, oh, this patient's got a suspected femoral nerve injury or like a suspected common fibula nerve injury or something, um, at the end, you might want to chuck this in if you've got a bit of time. Just it can win you brownie points. It might be part of the OSCE as well. I'm not too sure. But again, we've talked about the motor functions and sensory functions of these nerves. So test their motor function. Test their cutaneous distributions using your um, light touch pinprick or whatever. Um, and you can just point out, oh, okay, I'm going to test femoral like, cutaneous sensation right now. And like go down the anterior thigh, go down the medial leg, and then be like, okay, this is normal or be like, oh, I'm going to test for common peroneal nerve function and get them to dorsiflex their foot or check the sensation on the back of their foot and be like, okay, no, this is fine. Yeah. Um, farm, do we want to do this? <coughs> Hands up if you want to do this. Hands up if you don't want to do this. Yeah. All right. It's pretty boring. Okay. It's there for you guys to read. Um, cool.
Um, uh, so, yeah. um, so we'll come back at about twelve thirty ish, just because the next one's cardio and it's a it's a very long one. Um, but there's food outside. There's Subway and donuts, and I may have gone overkill with the donuts. So take as many as you want. <laughs> and for everyone on Zoom, we'll come back with a new code. <laughs> Thank you.